just like to take up your pew Bibles and turn to Genesis 32. That's where we are today, as we've learnt so well in the kids' talk. We're continuing on in hearing about Jacob. Jacob went on his way, and God's angels met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, This is God's camp. So he called that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messages ahead to him, to his brother Esau, in the land of Seir, the territory of Edom. He commanded them, You are say to my lord Esau, This is what your servant Jacob says. I have been staying with Laban and have been delayed until now. I have oxen donkeys, flocks, and male and female slaves. I have sent this message to inform my Lord in order to seek your favour. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau. He is coming to meet you, and he has 400 men with him. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people with him into two camps, along with the flocks, herds, and camels. He thought, If Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, the remaining one can escape. Then Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family and I will cause you to prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Indeed, I crossed over the Jordan with my staff and now I have become two camps. Please rescue me from my brother Esau, for I am afraid of him. Otherwise he may come and attack me, the mothers and their children. You have said I will cause you to prosper, and I will make your offspring like the sand of the sea, too numerous to be counted. He spent the night there and took part of what he had brought with him as a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He entrusted them to his slaves as separate herds and said to them, go on ahead of me and leave some distance between the herds. We're just going to skip down to verse 21 then. So the gift was sent on ahead of him while he remained in the camp that night. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two slave women and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he answered, Why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life has been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Peniel, limping because of his hip. That is why still today the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the thigh muscle. This is the word of the Lord. And I'm going to pray as well. Our Lord Father, we do indeed thank you for it, your word. And as we've already prayed, it is good to us. It corrects us and trains us and teaches us. And Lord, we pray that you would be doing that this morning. Uh, And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable in your your sight, our Lord 
and our rock. Amen. Most seasons of life have a beginning and an end. Usually the beginning and the end are very different. The enthusiasm and excitement of a new job or a new school, they're very different, aren't they, to finishing up at the job or at a school. Each season of life that God sends his people changes them. We grow, maybe we just grow older, but we also change. I'm sure you can think of some time in your life when you were changed dramatically by particular events or things that happened to you. In today's passage, Jacob is ending a particular season of his life. The writer of Genesis gives us a number of signposts in chapter 32, so we get the message, this is significant, this time. And these signposts connect chapters 28 and 32, and it's a good exercise to sit down and read them side by side. The events are 20 years apart. When Jacob is on his way to Paddan Paddan Aram, he lies down to sleep at Bethel. And what does he do? He dreams of angels. And here he is again, meeting angels as he's returning at Mahanaim. The sun sets at Bethel as he lies down to sleep. The sun rises on him as he passes by Peniel. Jacob names both places, those names I've been using, they're names he gave them. He makes a commitment to God at Bethel. He prays to God at Mahanaim. That's just a few, and there's others as well. And apparently in the Hebrew, the connections are even greater. We're meant to see a beginning and an end. We're meant to see a leaving, a returning but we're also meant to see change. We're meant to see that through this time, through 20 years working for Laban, Jacob has been changed, and that change has been very dramatic. It's been a dramatic season for Jacob, and he's vastly changed by it. As we heard in the kids' talk, when Jacob left the land, he was running away from Esau. Esau had spoken of his desire to kill him as soon as Isaac was dead. Rebecca said, oh, it'll all blow over in a few years, just a few days, just go away and I'll let you know when it's, when it's settled. It's 20 years. Jacob's heard nothing from Rebecca. He's only returning now to get away from his father-in-law. So in some ways he's running from something again. But he's also returning because God's told him to go back to the land. He's not actually returning because of Esau. But on the way, he's intending to try and reconcile things to gain Esau's favour. Jacob could easily avoid Esau. Esau's on the eastern side of the Jordan, down near the Dead Sea. That's where he is. Jacob's coming from the north. And he could easily take a more westerly route and avoid Esau in the east. But he wants to make things right with his brother. So he heads towards him. So he's doing this on his own own initiative. And he's actually quite prepared to give Esau a large amount of the wealth that he's accumulated in order to make things right. But he's still anxious, isn't he? We see that rise up very quickly. He sends messages on ahead to feel out how things are with Esau. And when he hears Esau's coming towards him with 400 men, he assumes the worst. Reading in verse 7, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people with him into two camps, along with the flocks, herds and camels. He thought, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, the remaining one can escape. Now, the standard size of a fighting unit at the time was 400 men. So when he hears that number, whoa, his alarm bells go off. And in his anxiety, Jacob reacts by doing two things. The first thing sounds like the old Jacob. 
He splits his people into two camps. Wise move. If Esau attacks, at least half the people will escape. He's still a planner. He always has a plan. But as Ben reminded us last week, taking things in their own hands doesn't always get the best result. And Jacob's plans have often caused a lot of damage, as they have with Esau. Or sometimes they're ineffectual, like when he's throwing sticks in the water to try and change the colour of the sheep. Then Jacob does something he hasn't done before. He prays. It's not the first thing he does, but at least it's the second thing he does. And it is a proper prayer. It's interesting to compare this prayer to the words he said to God back in chapter 28. Here's what he said in chapter 28. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I'm making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone I've set up as a marker, that'll be God's house. As if. And I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. He's mighty generous, isn't he? Here in chapter 32, it's a very different conversation. Jacob admits that he is undeserving of all God has done for him. He confesses his unworthiness. He asks God to rescue him. And at both the beginning and the end of the prayer, he reminds God of the promises he's made. It's a very different Jacob. The last 20 years have changed him. Here is a man trying to reconcile things with his brother. Here is a man acknowledging he is unworthy. Here is a man who said to Laban in chapter 31, If God hadn't been on my side, I would have come away from you empty-handed. Twenty years, hard, grinding work for Laban, and he's found out what it's like to be dealing with a liar and a cheat, just as he is. God's opened his eyes, hasn't he? He can now see, at least, some of what God has been doing. In verse 9 we read, Then Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Go back to your land and to your family and I will cause you to prosper. I am unworthy. Unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Indeed, I crossed over the Jordan with my staff. Only my staff. And now I have become two camps. He can see that all his worldly success is not his doing. And he can see that God has been working through all the hardship, all the muck, two feuding wives, all Laban's lies and tricks, all the cold, hard nights out with the flocks. God's been working through all those things to fulfil his promises. And Jacob can see that now. And so he prays. A real prayer. God has shown him that God is faithful and he will do as he says, even if he does it through the muck of this life. But Jacob hasn't been a quick learner, has he? Been a lot of pain. And God has used that to teach him. 20 years down the track, 20 years to begin to see God's faithfulness. And now, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. He's recognised he doesn't deserve it. God has chosen to be generous to Jacob because God has chosen to be generous to Jacob. It is God's choosing 
God's grace, God's undeserved generosity and mercy. Through so many disappointments and difficult relationships, God has been at work to transform Jacob and to fulfil his promises. What a display of marvellous grace. Then we come to the wrestle in verse 24. Imagine being Jacob. He's obviously anxious about Esau coming. He's prayed. Then he makes the best preparations he can for Esau's arrival. Yet in the middle of the night, he thinks of something else, another plan. He decides it's less risky for the family to cross over the Jabbok, which is a steep, swiftly flowing river coming out of the mountains down to the Jordan. It's less risky to cross that at night with his family than it is for them all to wait for Esau to come to him. So he gets his family, he probably wakes them up and sends them and his possessions across the river in the dark and he's left alone. And this mysterious stranger appears and grabs him in the dark and they begin to wrestle. Now, I can imagine Jacob's already, like all his senses are already pretty highly heightened and then this bloke, mysterious bloke appears and starts to wrestle with him. Sounds like a recipe for panic to me. Yet Jacob fights back and a long period of wrestling begins. I don't know if you've ever wrestled somebody. Um, in my younger days, I used to do it. it. It's hard work. It's really hard work. Grabbing, grasping, levering, pushing, pulling. And you're pulling and pushing on sweaty, slippery bodies. <laughs> It uses a lot of muscles and you reach your breaking point very quickly. You're exhausted. Yet Jacob and this man do this until daybreak and I can't imagine how he would have done it without having periods of rest. The struggle would have reduced down and they just would have lay there for a bit and got their wind back and then they would have gone again. Jacob would have been utterly spent. I've had a dislocated shoulder. I don't know if you've had a dislocated limb. Um, in my experience, it wasn't exactly painful. There's just this awful feeling of something being out wrong, something being out of place. The pain comes later. Um... When it goes back in, it's oh, relief. <laughs> the desire to give in, to let go of this man, to stop the wrestle. It must have been immense. How he could have summoned the mental and the physical energy to hold on. I do not know, but I sort of know. And yet he does. I will not go unless you bless me. The thing about this wrestle is it's representative of all of Jacob's life. He's had this need, this need to gain the favour of people, the blessing of people. We read about it, he wants to go back and gain Esau's favour. He sought it from Isaac, from Laban, from God. And here he will not let go until the man blesses him. And in response, the man asks him for his name. Now, names are important. Names are an indication of character. By giving the name, his name, Jacob, he's essentially confessing to being a deceiver. I think Ben used the terms crooked rat last week. And then the man gives Jacob something very important, a new name. In part is a recognition that Israel is not the same man he was when he headed towards Laban. Over the past 20 years, God has transformed him as we learn. 
In part, it's a recognition of what lies ahead for Israel. He's going to continue to struggle with God as God shapes him for heaven with more struggles. There's going to be a daughter raped. There's going to be new family conflicts. He's going to have the grief of losing a son. Drought will come. He'll have to move from the land. The wrestle here is a metaphor for all of Jacob's life. As Genesis goes on, sometimes Jacob's called Jacob and sometimes he's called Israel. That's not what happens with Abraham and Sarah, is it? They go from their old names to their new names and their new names stick. Jacob's name keeps changing. Sometimes it's Jacob, sometimes it's Israel. It's as if his old character emerges and his new character emerges and his old character comes back and his new character comes back. His wrestling continues as long as he lives. But the name Israel isn't just given to Jacob, is it? That becomes the name of the nation. And they too will struggle with God. They'll face many hardships. They'll be banished. They'll face judgment. They'll wander in the desert. They'll wander away from God and then repent over and over. Through all of this, God continues to save a people for himself. God works through the sins of this world. I saw a quote from a pastor, a long-time pastor, that said he had never heard anyone say how much they'd grown as a Christian through good times. Rather, every time a Christian claimed they had really grown, it was through pain and difficulty and testing. So I ask you, when have you really grown in your faith? I'm almost certain it'll be in times of struggle. Many of the prophets struggle with the message that they are asked to take to the world. Jonah's the most obvious case, he runs away. In the Psalms, David and the other writers question God. We read one today. They struggle with his apparent absence, his apparent silence. They struggle with his judgment on Israel or his patience with the other nations around them. God is not like us. Sometimes his mercy and judgment suit us. Sometimes they frustrate us. Job had everything taken from him and his wife said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us of praying three times for God to remove a thorn from his flesh. Three times. No relief. And as we read today on the Mount of Olives, our Lord Jesus, the true Israel, prayed for the Father to take the cup of judgment from him if he was willing. And it didn't finish there. On the cross he also cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The people of God are not comfortable. They struggle with God and they struggle with men. We're a people with a home in heaven, living in a sinful, messy painful world yet the irony is God uses that same world all its difficulties all its pain to transform us just as he used it to change Jacob he changes us Bernard and Andrew called it the discipline of disappointment In the end, the prophets took God's message to the people. 
Even Jonah did. Job replied immediately to his wife, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? The psalmists almost always return to rejoicing and praising God, just as we heard in Psalm 13 today. Paul acknowledges that God's purpose in not removing the thorn was to keep him from becoming conceited. And then Paul boasted all the more gladly in his weakness, because in that weakness, Christ's power was evident. And after his prayer on the mount, our Lord Jesus yielded to the will of his Father and an angel of the Lord appeared to strengthen him. Strengthen him for the wrestle to come. And then when our Lord was hanging from the cross, being afflicted with the sins of the world, yours and mine, he well knew that the psalm he quoted from, it finishes with words of victory. The victory of the Lord and the proclamation of his righteousness to the ends of the earth. The pattern is clear. The people of God struggle with God. Those who don't belong to God, they don't have a problem. There's no struggle with them, not with God. But this struggle has a known outcome. God does not desert those who are his. His promise to Jacob was, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, among other things. Jesus promised his disciples, and behold... I am with you always till the end of the age. These promises are more solid than stone. They do not erode away. God uses the hard, the difficult, the painful things of this world to transform his people and to show them that he is faithful. Their task, our task, is to hold on to him no matter the difficulty and the pain. And in his grace, God will provide the strength and energy for us to do that. He does it for Jacob. He does it for the prophets. He does it for Job. He does it for David, for Paul, and even for Jesus himself. Calvin described it as God, in his grace, fighting against us with his left hand, and for us with his right hand. He understood God's right hand to be the stronger and the hand that would triumph. He understood the outcome to be certain. God's right hand is for us. He will not lose us. He will not test us beyond what we can bear. But he does use trials and difficulties to refine us to teach us new and deeper levels of dependence upon him, to show us that he is our only true, lasting refuge. Instead of praying, I'm going to read from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now, for a short time, If necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen.